First of all, to, inter to introduce um, our speaker, who is Faye Cosgrove. Um, Faye, as you know, has been a primary school teacher since 2005, is a regional lead practitioner for numeracy, a facilitator for the Outstanding Teacher Programme, and she's been a consultant on the West Welsh Government's expert panel, is still a consultant. Uh, she has master's degrees in education and social science research methods and has conducted research for the National Network for Excellence in Maths. So it's really good to have Faye here. It's particularly good because she was also going to, going to contribute to an earlier webinar, um, an earlier meeting, um, but was not able to do so for various reasons. So we're really pleased that we can give her a, a whole webinar to herself now, which is much better. Um, I'd also like to specifically welcome um, Tim Rowland, who we are talking about the uh, the Knowledge Quartet, and this is an invention of Tim's. Um, so I think I ought to let you know that Tim is there. I can see him, actually. So it's really good to see you, Tim, um, uh, who is an old uh, friend of mine um, and uh, was at Cambridge for many years and has been at different universities uh, since then. Um, so uh, we're very pleased that he's here uh, and uh, that he you know, is involved in this work. OK, I think we're ready to go. So, Faye, would you like to start us off? Certainly. Yes. Hello, everybody. Um, thank you for joining us. As Margaret has said, it's really good to see everybody uh, and to know that there is, um, you know, a good interest in maths anxiety and um, in particularly in reducing it in schools. Um, and again, thank you for giving me this opportunity since I did miss out on the last one due to ill health. Um, so I'm going to talk to you tonight about uh, a research project um, that I ran at my school, um, which was designed to look at whether teacher maths anxiety can be reduced. Uh, and the intervention we used um, was reflection using the knowledge quartet. Uh, and as mentioned, the lead author is with us this evening. Um, so I'm going to spend um, the first uh, part of our time um, telling you about what we did, about the research, how it was designed and what it found. And then in the second half, speak uh, in much more depth about the knowledge quartet. Um, I'm, and then I have some examples that we can talk about and hopefully you can have a little bit of practice reflecting on someone else's teaching using uh, elements of the knowledge quartet. Uh, and then we'll have time for questions. Uh, so first of all, maths anxiety. I, I assume that lots of people are familiar with the idea of maths anxiety, and that's one of the reasons that you're here this evening. Um, but this is one of the definitions which is commonly used. Maths anxiety is feelings of tension. Uh, this anxiety that interferes, um, and often for, for people it interferes with them demonstrating the maths that they can do, um, and also it, it tends to interfere with the learning of new maths. Uh, that applies in school and in classroom type situations but also in, in everyday life. Um, and this is what it can feel like. <laughs> um, it can feel like, you know, OK, one plus one is two. That's fine. I've got that. Um, but uh, uh, then suddenly in the exam, it, it changes quite dramatically. And suddenly you're, you're being asked to calculate the mass of the sun with uh, no information to go on. So it's a, it can be a real sort of panic moment. Um, people talk about that wall going up. Um, so mass anxiety in, in the research literature is um, reliably negatively correlated with performance in maths uh, in children and in adults. Um, and in fact, um, according to Fo uh, Foley et al, uh, a few years ago in 2017, the more able the pupil, the more detrimental the effect of mass anxiety, uh, even when you then control for other factors. Um, and uh, a lot of uh, authors talking about mass anxiety talk about there being a bi-directional effect um, where you end up with a sort of intensifying cycle. Maths anxiety makes it hard to practice maths, um, makes it hard to learn maths, makes you want to avoid maths. And so this this cycle goes on. And um, uh, according to some authors, it's co probably contributing to Western society's acceptance uh, of poor number skills. Um, it was really typified. There was an advert, a L'Oreal Paris advert in 2015, where Dame Helen Mirren was happy to say that age is just a number and maths was never my thing. You know, we're very comfortable saying that we're not good at maths. Um, and perhaps that's part of the avoidance. Perhaps it's part of maths anxiety making us just <laughs> want to run in the other direction. 
Um, so why does teacher maths anxiety matter in particular? There's two studies I want to show you, uh, tell you about. And the first is by Baylock et al from 2010. Both of these are American studies uh, and they looked at 17 female primary teachers and their 117 uh, pupils and found that maths anxiety reliably predicts outcomes for female pupils in their sample to a small but statistically significant degree. Um, they found that there was no effect on the boys in their study. Uh, and they said this suggests that the teachers are teaching maths to at least an adequate standard, possibly they're teaching maths well, but somehow this maths anxiety is still being transmitted uh, and transferred to some of the pupils. More recently, there's been a larger study along very similar lines, um, 40 primary teachers and over 150 pupils. Uh, they found the effect uh, was with both male and female pupils, um, and even when they controlled for things like uh, the teacher's own level of maths knowledge, the children's level of math skills at the start of the year, um, they still found um, this connection between the teacher feeling anxious about maths having a detrimental effect on pupil maths performance by the end of the year. So teacher maths anxiety matters, um, and if we can reduce it, that will help the teachers um, because that, you know, it enhances their own well-being um, and it should have a positive effect on the pupil attitudes to maths and, and their learning and uh, abilities in maths. Um, so the research project that I conducted at school, um, this is a, a word cloud of some of the, the words the teachers were using in their reflections on their own teaching. It was a small scale research project at, at, the, teach, at the school where I teach. Um, took place over just four months, so not, not a huge study, uh, and we began with only four teacher participants. Um, initially, they were two reflective pairs, but one teacher dropped out. Um, so, in fact, I became a reflective partner for one of those teachers so that we still had two pairs. Um, and of those three teachers, two appeared to have significant maths anxiety at the start, um, the, um, enough maths anxiety that it was bothering them. Um, and the third volunteered to take part because she wanted to improve her maths teaching. Um, so I, I wanted a, some kind of teacher professional development opportunity um, that was not uh, the passive type. Um, Orbs and et al have criticized uh, lots of teacher learning programs because they're so passive. Um, you sit and listen, someone talks to you, you know, listen to what I say, absorb it, go and do it. Whereas this is not something that is done to you. This is uh, more of the sort of um, teacher learning opportunity where you're doing something for yourself. It should be an empowering experience. Um, and these are the four dimensions of the knowledge quartet uh, that we're gonna talk about in some uh, in more depth later on. Uh, so I, we collected data, both quantitative and qualitative data. Uh, the quantitative measures were a scale to measure, measure maths anxiety. Um, in fact, that scale is not um, standardised with teachers because there is no scale for specifically with teachers in the UK. That's what my current PhD study is aiming to, to address. Um, and then we also looked at uh, the general self-efficacy. Um, self-efficacy is that idea of your, your own perception of your effectiveness. So, uh, Self-efficacy for maths, for example, that third scale there is how effective do I think I am as a maths teacher? How um, effective do I think I am at letting my pupils learn new maths? Uh, we also had quite a lot of qual qualitative data. I asked everybody at the start to draw themselves doing maths and they annotated their drawing and they narrated um, and we recorded it as part of a semi-structured interview, both before and after. Uh, and then we had the teaching episodes um, they were all recorded and I had that data, uh, the joint reflection recordings, uh, and then the notes that uh, participants made. This is what I asked them to do. Um, I asked them to record themselves teaching. And I think that is quite a powerful part of this. Um, I think it's really important that you are able to step outside of your, sh your shoes, you know, stand in, put yourself in the shoes of someone else in your classroom to look at yourself with, with fresh eyes. Um, I think it's important that the video is there to help with that experience. You can't rely on your own memory because 
as anyone who teaches knows, when you are standing there in front of a group of learners, your mind is fully occupied with the process of teaching. I know that for myself, I find it very difficult to reserve a part of my brain to reflect on what I'm doing in the moment that I'm doing it. Um, this gives a, an opportunity for something that's a lot more in depth. So I asked them to record themselves teaching. Uh, this is a this little camera is a three uh, 360 degree camera, so that it's recording everything that's happening in the classroom, both looking at the teacher and looking at the pupils. Uh, not everybody used that, or that some of the time I just propped an iPad up on a desk somewhere, and you know it doesn't have to be high tech. Uh, then so after that. Uh, at the end of that day, I've gone home, I've taken my recording home with me, and I'm watching the recording back. Um, and I found the more I watched it, the more I noticed about my own teaching. Uh, this is when I, this isn't during the research project, I had used it for my own for reflection previous, uh, previously, and I asked them to do what I had done, which was select little moments. So I might have recorded a 10 or 15 minute lesson introduction, but then at home, I'm identifying, ah, there's a 30 second incident there um, that I, I want to really think carefully about that. Or later on, oh, it was, just, it was only 10 seconds, but that's telling me something about my teaching that I didn't realize before. So identify those critical incidents, reflect on them using the knowledge quartet, um, record the timestamp so that when I then uh, meet with my partner, we're not going to sit down and watch the whole 15 minute lesson introduction. I'm just going to say, right, we need to watch this 30 seconds. And I'd like to know what you think. This is what I think. What, what do you think about this? Um, so you're recording the timestamp. You're recording the knowledge quartet code. And I'll show you those in a minute um, and, and a comment. Um, I asked everybody to make sure that for any uh, episode that they had recorded, they identified strengths and opportunities for development. I think probably just as human beings, but certainly as teachers, we can be quite self-critical. It's much easier to say, oh, I didn't think I could have done better with that, or oh, I don't, don't like how I did that. You, you must force yourself <laughs> to look, ah, oh, actually, that was really good. I'm quite pleased with the way I responded to that pupil comment, or oh, using that number stick, oh, that really helped. It, it really made it concrete, or you know, look for those strengths as well as the opportunities for improvement. Uh, then meet up with your partner and discuss those little clips. Don't watch the whole thing together. Discuss those little clips. Um, and in that way, it's part of the empowerment because you as the, it's not someone coming in and watching your lesson and then giving you feedback from their observation. You're saying, no, this is the bit I want to consider. You selecting it for yourself. Um, and I think it also helps when you know that you're going to meet up with someone else. Actually, if something happened that you really would just prefer didn't happen, you do have the option to not select that incident. You can just sweep it under the carpet and save your blushes if you, if you feel that's important. Um, I don't actually think that happened very much because I found that um, there was quite a lot of trust built up between partners. Um, and I think that's a key part of using the knowledge quartet, that it is a supportive activity. It's not a critical uh, challenge activity. It's a supportive, let's work on this together. Um, and so I asked them to repeat this, these steps one to five um, for four cycles. So every teacher recorded themselves four times at every reflection, they met, they met to reflect together four times and at each reflection, both uh, participants brought a recording to reflect on. So uh, I mentioned earlier, I asked people to draw themselves before and after. Here is participant three. Um, this person at the start is saying that they felt worried. Um, this person had the highest maths anxiety at the start uh, and their maths anxiety decreased by 18%. Um, there were some, also some gains in teaching efficacy, but they were a little smaller. Um, in the before drawing, this person is saying, I'm feeling worried that the answer is not quite right. Sometimes I feel I don't quite know the best or the correct method to answer a problem. But then after, not only has it changed from a black felt pen to a green one, uh, but now this person is saying, I felt like I was a facilitator. Generally, I was feeling quite confident. I wasn't worried about what questions would come from the children. I was never uncomfortable. Um, and even went so far as to say in, in the exit interview, um, this teacher commented, um, 
that this was like therapy, that this experience had been like therapy, because previously they'd uh, really spoken about when they were in teacher training, going to school every morning feeling sick because they knew they had to teach maths. Um, and it had been sort of a secret. It hadn't really been something that had been discussed much, but suddenly now there's this opportunity to talk with someone that, I mean, I, mean, I felt that they trusted me to be able to open up as much as they did. Uh, and they said that, yeah, it'd been like therapy. <laughs> um, since I've been reflecting on my teaching a lot more, especially after the video, watching the video clips, I'm more aware of how I say things. Uh, here's participant two. Um, this teacher's maths anxiety was the second highest at the start, but uh, showed the biggest decrease in maths anxiety, 38% decrease uh, over just these four uh, reflections. Uh, and also encouraging in increases in teaching efficacy, 21 and 28%. Uh, on the two scales. In the before drawing, those comments say things like, help, I need to write it down. Uh, and also commented that I hate long division, absolutely with a passion, it really frightens me. Um, but then by the end, again, quite an interesting change, quite a lot of change. There's a big thumbs up, there's a big smile on that face. Um, and the comment was, um, being videoed made me feel anxious. It made me think, oh my gosh, what might you have picked up from my lesson? And before I came in, I, I kept thinking, I, I picked these things out. I don't know if these are okay. And I wondered if you would pick the same things out or if there would be a lot of opportunities and not so many strengths. Um, but then said, we often picked almost identical sessions of the lesson. And I came away thinking, oh, I do actually know what I'm talking about. <laughs> After every lesson we looked at together, I felt relieved. And I think it was a good experience to look at myself on video, even though I didn't particularly like it. Uh, I learned an awful lot about myself and how I teach. Um, so, you know, these comments are saying not only did they end up feeling less anxious about maths, but also felt less anxious about their teaching of maths. Um, and here's participant one. This is the person who didn't particularly feel bothered by maths anxiety at the start. Um, but volunteered because uh, wanting to improve the maths teaching. Um, so her scores on the scales didn't change so much um, because it hadn't been that much of a problem for her in the first place. Um, but the qualitative data that you can see there is encouraging. Um, felt that the intervention had uh, had a positive effect, um, that she did feel more confident in her teaching, even though she hadn't felt so underconfident at the beginning, she actually did feel more confident um, by the end. Um, the intervention had the greatest impact on participant two, um, who had the second highest maths anxiety at the start. Um, and that also happens to be the, part, the participant who worked with me um, because it was her uh, partner that withdrew. Um, and I can't know whether that was of any relevance or not. Um, but I do, I, again, I want to say that the trust between participants um, trust between those reflective partners is really important and that, um, you know, this is a supportive process. And, and what she described about uh, feeling nervous, what would I say, what, what would be talked about at the beginning and then actually coming away each time relieved. I think that's really important. Um, I do know what I'm talking about. <laughs> so, um, the obviously, this is a very small scale project. There were only three participants. Uh, it was only four reflections. Um, there's a lot that I don't know coming away from this project, but um, it, it does seem that something can be done. It doesn't have to cost a lot. Um, it doesn't have to take a huge amount of time. Um, so while more research is needed to determine when, how, and for whom such an appro approach might be effective, it does seem possible to reduce teacher maths anxiety using fairly modest interventions. Um, it's important that they're designed well and it's important that the people involved understand the ethos of it. Um, but it seems like it can be done, at least for some teachers. And of course, there's a lot to be gained because if we can reduce teacher maths anxiety, then that's likely to lead to reduced maths anxiety in pupils um, and therefore improved maths attainment for pupils. Um, it therefore increases well-being for teachers, but also for pupils, um, and in the long term could improve engagement with STEM, um, STEM subjects and STEM careers, which open opportunities then for children and, and those life choices then are broadened. Um, if you want to read about it, um, I've just put this slide in. Uh, all these slides will be available later. Um, there's a couple of places where I've written about it that you can read about. Um, 
and here's some of the references that I've mentioned. So moving on into the second part then, that was the overview of the project itself. Now I want us to spend time zooming in on the Knowledge Quartet, um, because if maybe there are some people here this evening who are thinking, I'd really like to do this. Um, it's something that you could pick up, it's ready. Um, it's, you, it, it could be picked up and um, applied in a school. That There's not a lot of work to be done to make it usable. It's already usable. So the Knowledge Quartet, which you've heard mentioned uh, a few times already, by Raoul and Dettel. Tim is here and <laughs> I'm going to ask him if he wants to add anything later on. Um, those are the four dimensions which we're going to look at. This is the book um, that supports it all. Um, and there is also a website, oops, there is also a website, uh, knowledgequartet.org, which has a lot of resources um, and a lot of video clips and a lot of scenarios to help you um, understand the possible reflections um, and how that might improve teaching. So I want to go back to the beginning of the development of the Knowledge Quartet. Go back to 1987 and um, a really influential researcher, Lee Shulman. Um, already there had been uh, it established in the research literature that generic, uh, talked a lot about generic knowledge. Um, you know, every profession has a knowledge base. Other educated people who aren't teachers don't need to know it, but we as teachers need to know it because that's our profession. That's the knowledge base. And it had already been talked about quite a lot, generic knowledge, knowledge of pedagogy that you would use in any lesson or in any part of school life, um, knowledge of learners, knowledge of the education context, of the purposes and its values and all of those things. Um, but what was missing, uh, which Lee Shulman called the, the missing paradigm, uh, was the more specific knowledge, content knowledge. Um, and we're talking about content knowledge specific to maths, uh, subject matter knowledge about product and processes that are specific to maths, um, pedagogical knowledge, the sort of pedagogy that you might only use in maths, um, and particularly the types of analogies, the sorts of examples, the way we might demonstrate things in maths, um, and the materials and programs available to maths. And this is what the Knowledge Quartet aims to build on this idea of the missing paradigm that's much more subject specific um, it's this subject matter knowledge that the knowledge quartet concerns and this was the motivation behind the development of the quartet how can teacher educators and school-based mentors be assisted in giving more attention to mathematical content and i would also add to that how can classroom practitioners ourselves? How can we be empowered to become more self-improving? Um, often, I, I know this is true of my own teaching career, when someone comes in to observe a lesson and I then get feedback, it's very often the more generalised feedback. It's very rare that someone comes and gives very subject-specific feedback. Um, so this framework aims to empower anybody who wants to give more math specific feedback, um, which is really important because secure content knowledge is associated with greater competence in primary math teaching. Um, and conversely, uh, looking at trainees, uh, trainees with weak content knowledge are disproportionately likely to be assessed as weak in teaching. Um, that's from a Rowland et al paper from 2001. Um, they used a th uh, an approach called grounded theory. Um, Grounded theory started with Glasser and Strauss in the late 1960s. And it, it, the idea is that you start with the data. Rather than starting with a hypothesis or a theory, I'm gonna see if this is true, start with the data and build your theory from there. Uh, so they analyze lessons, um, uh, be sorry, beginning in 2002 and continuing as far as I am aware, uh, a team of researchers. Um, so this is not just one person's opinion, this is the culmination of a group of people's op opinions um, and experiences and expertise. Uh, they videoed 24 lessons to start with, um, and those were taught by 12 trainee primary teachers. Um, although since then, again, that's been added to, particularly if you look at the website, um, you'll see that there are recordings have been added since, so it's not just trainee teachers anymore. Um, and as I've said, the focus is on teachers' mathematical content knowledge rather than general pedagogical issues. So let's go back to those four dimensions that we saw in yellow before. The Knowledge Quartet is made up of these four sections. So imagine they've recorded these uh, 
teaching episodes and they've um, the researchers have been working together I've noticed this was a real strength there that was an opportunity to, maybe that could have been improved and they are uh, coding those observations what are the themes that are coming out from these recordings and then some of those codes were combined and some of those codes might have been split up and made more specific um, and then it's sort of um, it was structured then into these four dimensions and we have the foundation uh, dimension. This is your knowledge as a teacher, um, that your beliefs about maths and maths pedagogy, whether or not they are observable in that moment. Um, and that's the foundation of the other three. Then we have the transformation uh, dimension. That's your ability to allow someone else to know what you know. That's you as a facilitator of learning in that context. And particularly important in maths is a selection of examples and representations. The connection dimension um, is to do with uh, knowing what the learners already, you know the learners already know these things. And so you can build from there. Um, the ability to sequence learning, to anticipate the misconceptions that have commonly come up, to anticipate the difficulty that's around the corner with the next step, um, and to be able to uh, steer through that path. Uh, and then contingency. And certainly for trainee teachers, this is where the most challenge comes. I would say, even as an experienced teacher, for me, this is where the most challenge comes too, because this is the unknown. It's much harder to prepare um, for contingency uh, moments is the teacher's response to the unexpected events when a child makes a comment you did not expect maybe they have made a mistake but you can capitalize on that mistake because um, mistakes are logical you know they come from partial understanding but they they come from some understanding maybe it's an over generalization or under generalization but um, if you are strong in this contingency dimension um, then you can capitalize on that those four dimensions then are broken down further uh, into these 20 codes. Um, and shortly we will um, have a chance to reflect on some teaching using these codes. In fact, maybe that wasn't a clear sentence, using some of these codes, because this is not a tick box exercise. It's really, uh, as a teacher, I, I get really turned off when something just appears to be ticking a box for the sake of it. Um, preparing for a lesson observation where you think oh, I've got to do all these six things because I know they're going to be looking for them even though they're not actually all so much relevant right now to this particular lesson but I must make sure I, I crowbar them in this isn't like that um, so you're never going to attempt to show off all 20 codes in a single teaching episode um, and you are never going to try to reflect on all of them in a single episode either so we'll watch some episodes in a minute. Oh, no, we have a technical problem. I was telling you about some teaching episodes shortly. Um, and the idea would be to probably just use one. Oh, I think that might have been an example of this code or of that code. Um, so I'm not going to read them all to you. They're there and I'll put them again on the screen uh, in a little while. Um, to help the participants, I came up with this little pro forma. So they had the 20 codes in front of them um, and they just had those little tables to, to record their comments in. And as you can see, we're not asking people to write very much at all. You don't need to write reams and reams or paragraphs or whatever. We want the code, the, the, the abbreviated code from the Knowledge Quartet, the timestamp and a sentence. Um, strengths and opportunities. Um, we're going to find a way as well of making this available to anyone who wants it. In a few days when the slides are uploaded, the video will be uploaded um, and we will upload this pro forma too. Um, so they'll be available soon from the, um, I believe it's from the Mass Anxiety Trust website. Is that, is that right? Yes, Margaret's nodding. Okay. So, okay, the plan was, this is a video clip and I wanted to show you Jason in action teaching these children. Um, as it is, I can't get the sound to you. So I'm going to tell you about this scenario instead. Apologies for that. Um, Jason is working with um, some year three children. So they're aged seven and eight. And um, this is a fractions lesson. Um, and they each have one of these mini whiteboards and a pen. Um, and he's already, uh, they've already recapped halves on the idea of splitting into two equal parts. And now he's asked them to split their whiteboards into quarters. 
and uh, he's chosen a couple of examples from the children. You can just about see it there, but I can make it a bit clearer there. Uh, one child, um, that's Rebecca, um, has a line vertically down the middle, a line across horizontally. And then a different child, Elliot, has gone diagonal corner to diagonal corner. And Jason has, has shown them both as examples. Uh, and he says, your challenge for this lesson is to think about what Elliot has done and if Elliot has split his into equal quarters. Um, in fact, this question is never returned to again in this lesson. <laughs> um, I will leave you to decide for yourself why you think that might or might not be. Um, but my question to you, knowing as you do only that tiny little bit about this teaching episode, um, which of the codes might you uh, use if you if you were Jason and you would watch your recording and you were reflecting on this teaching? Um, which of the codes might you choose to reflect on this? Um, and here is a little opportunity for anybody who is uh, wanting to perhaps share their observations, reflections with us. If you would like to unmute yourself and join the discussion, then you are very welcome to. Does anybody want to pick a code or maybe just pick a dimension? You could comment as a strength of the teaching or as an opportunity for improvement. Have we got any digital hands up, I wonder? I can't actually see everybody. Okay, maybe. Oh, I think Margaret's going to say something. Yeah, we have Zebedee, I think. Yeah. Uh, oh, fantastic. Can you... Um... Oh, hello, hi. 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 <laughs> I've only got through the first part of the list. I was thinking, so initially I was thinking foundation, IPE, identifying pupil errors, maybe, mm -hmm. um, OSK, mm -hmm. a vote, a vote a display of subject knowledge. knowledge. I hadn't really had a chance to read through the rest of them. Well, I think this might be a good example, actually, you can take just a, a few seconds of a lesson like that and probably apply it to more than one code because Zeb you've just identified a couple there I've made a note with a couple of different ones and I, I think that's um I found when I met with the um reflector partner during the research project that sometimes we had the same time code but then a different of the 20 codes so we'd identified the faint, same few seconds of teaching but made different perspectives on our reflection um, and I think what you just said Zeb was totally right absolutely um, I think it could also be something from the contingency dimension um, teacher insight or, or deviation from lesson agenda maybe he hadn't planned for it to go that way um, I think overt display of subject knowledge it, it may well be that he wasn't sure if the diagonally divided board actually was true quarters or not um, it, it, we can't know um, because I don't believe Jason was interviewed. But um, uh, Eleanor, what what would you like to say? Uh, I I was curious. What was the instruction? Uh, the instruction was divide your whiteboard into quarters. Okay, I understand. Okay. Yeah, that, I don't I don't think there was a long instruction. I think it was more about finding out what the children could already do. So divide your whiteboard into quarters. What was the year of the, the students? Year three, age seven and eight. Okay. No, because uh, if they say to divide the, the board in four equal parts, maybe it was clearer than dividing quarters because they making diagonals in a square. Yes, there are quarters, but in a rectangle, they are not. So maybe it's about terminology. Yes. That maybe it was the way the instruction was given. Uh, use of terminology is one of the codes from the Knowledge Quartet, and you yes. could absolutely I, reflect from I, that. I, try, I chose first the IPE, but then I said oh, there are many, can be many. Yes, I, I agree. I think there can be many. And I find as a teacher, this is one of the empowering things about this. I can choose for myself. That's the one I want to focus on. Um, or that's the one I really want someone to help me with, you know or I feel like that was a real strength. And then this is something I really want to work on developing now. But yeah, I don't, I don't think this is a right and wrong answer kind of situation. Um, but I will comment, um, <laughs> Rebecca's uh, gone for the sort of route one version. 
uh, those are clearly quarters. They can be placed on top of each other, which proves that they are equal. Um, and of course, they're congruent as well, which makes that stacking on top of each other really nice and easy. And the demonstration is very convincing. Um, Elliot went a different direction. And so those the parts that he chose aren't congruent. You can't just stack them on top of each other and prove they're equal. But if you split each one in half again and make them into eighths, then you've got stackable congruent pieces. Um, so you can show that half of each of these pieces were eighths. And if your learners are ready for that conversation, you can show that the two eighths make one quarter. Now, I don't think I would go there with year three, but if, for example, you'd had that similar scenario with year six, then you know that might be um, a, a better time to have that conversation. Um, and you might have that nice opportunity to use the word con congruent. And again, that would be use of terminology from one of those other codes. Um, yeah, so I'll leave you with that thought. Anyway, let's move on to a different scenario. This uh, teacher's pseudonym is Anne, um, and she's using a, a resource called Talk It Solve It. And uh, that is quite an old resource now, but it's still absolutely fantastic. I really love Talk It Solve It. Mm. Um, and this is one of the examples. Um, it's often used as a sort of process of elimination type of reasoning activity uh, where they're given, the children are given a batch of clues um, and some examples, and they use the clues to use a process, make, uh, go through a process of elimination and find out which the target shape was. So this is uh, into a sequence of lessons about quadrilaterals, um, and there's a lot of terminology going on. Um, again, I can't play you the clip, I apologise, but this was the classroom, um, and you can see the teacher has a large version of the resource on the, the board there, um, and the children have been, uh, they're already partway through this activity. They um, have a, a conversation and they are going through the remaining shapes and the teacher is saying what's the name of this quadrilateral what's the name of this quadrilateral so they've already had a parallelogram named correctly on one of the others which i forget apologies uh, and they come to the bottom left shape there on the bank of examples um, and a pupil says uh well they they first they, they say the word isosceles, but then didn't don't finish any sentence. Uh, and then a diff, I think uh, a different pupil is then chosen and they say the word trapezoid and the teacher reflects back and says, ah, yes, it's a trapezoid or a trapezium. And the teacher presents those two words. Uh, the child said tra trapezoid. The teacher says, yes, tra trapezoid or trapezium. Now, I know you've not had much time to reflect, but if I put the 20 codes back up, does anybody want to comment uh, on that? I know you didn't get to actually see the video, I'm sorry. Um, naming quadrilaterals, child says trapezoid, teacher says, yes, it's a trapezoid or a trapezium. And the word isosceles has been mentioned as well. Any virtual hands up? Anybody want to unmute and just speak? There's some things in the chat. Oh, I can't see the chat. Um, yeah, this is Don, Donna Lynn Shepherd. I, I, I think um, has UT and somebody has RSI. Okay, um, so good use of terminology. That yeah. makes sense. And what was the other yeah. one? Sorry. RSI, which is responding to students' Res ideas. Right. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So th they, I think those are probably the two that came to my mind first as well. Yeah. yeah. Um, let me bring this up. OK, this is um, a US UK problem. I think you probably figured this out already. Um, the example uh, was what we would in the UK called a trapezium. And in America, they would use the word trapezoid for that shape. So in the UK, a trapezium is a concave quadrilateral with at least one pair of opposite sides called bases, uh, opposite parallel sides called bases. And there is an isosceles trapezium, which is like a truncated isosceles triangle. Um, and then the opposite is true in the US. Um, we would call that shape on the right a trapezoid, whereas in America, then they would call that a trapezium. So my guess 
about this child who made the comment that I, I know that they're a very keen mathematician and that they really enjoy maths. So my guess is they've been on YouTube and they've probably been adding to their understanding at home, which is fantastic and totally to be encouraged. But then, of course, we have this problem where the Internet is sometimes dominated by the US. Um, but the teacher in that moment just accepted them both as synonyms. Um, and they're not synonyms. So I think use of terminology um, is true. And then I think you could also argue because she was responding to a pupil's contribution that maybe that wasn't the time to clear up this misconception. Maybe that was a time to just accept that answer, provide the close, the word that's close and correct and move on from there. Um, although that's a teacher who I reflected with on that particular lesson. Um, and she did confess afterwards, that actually, she wasn't sure which of the right word was. And so she had gone away and found out. Um, and that's the power of recording yourself teaching. I have one more scenario, which I'm just going to tell you about, because uh, time is a little bit short. Um, the recording actually is only about five seconds long anyway. And this is me <laughs> in my classroom. Um, this is not my finest moment, I will prepare you. <laughs> um, I was teaching a class of year six. Uh, and at this point in time, which was a little while ago now, we had uh, the minability sets. This was a top set. Um, and we were use we were talking about difference between use uh, crossing zero. Um, I'd had a number stick that I'd held horizontally and vertically. It had a zero on it in the middle so that we could cross zero and point to this number stick. Um, and so then we, I was getting examples of uh, the difference between, give me two, two numbers, the difference between. Um, and you can't really see what I've written on the board, so I've typed it for you clearly here. And now you can. I said things like the difference between two and negative four is six, the difference between three and negative two is five, that's fine. Um, but then I said the difference between negative two and three is five. What I said was true, that was fine. But what I didn't realize until I watched the video is the way I'd written it down was really misleading. And my uh, representation was very poor because mathematically, I don't think you can defend that. The difference, uh, yeah, what's written, what was said was fine. What was written is not fine. Um, so that's just um, me putting my money where my mouth is a little bit, but also just to reinforce the idea that videoing yourself is so important because there is no way in a month of Sundays, I would not have picked that up if I hadn't watched the video. Um, so before we ask for any questions, Tim, um, Tim Rowland is here. He's the lead author of the Knowledge Quartet. Um, and I've been talking to him all this time about his own creation. So, um, Tim, please, would you add anything that I haven't already said? Um, no, I mean, Faye, it's um, uh, I've, I've known you for the last six years, I think, and um, it's been a great encouragement to me to see what you've been doing, first of all, because um, we, we developed the knowledge quartet as you've explained within the context of, um, of initial teacher education um, people preparing to become teachers and um, um, since then it's rolled out to uh, many more contexts but I, you were the first person that I knew of who had applied it to a, a school-based situation and um, the fact that uh, you know uh, uh, you you've used it in connection with maths anxiety was um, quite a surprise but um i, I mean it, it it was it was very special um i um i i think um I'd, I'd just like to say too that your particular application of the knowledge quartet in terms of self-videoing and then uh, identifying points it's the teacher then is in control of mm. their own professional development. Mm. And I think you bring that out very well. Um, if we could have a second edition of this book, I'd like you to add a chapter. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe one day. <laughs> That's all for now, thank you. I, I, I think, you know, obviously this did come from the ITE context, initial teacher training context, but, um, as we've already said, I've been teaching for quite a long time and I just see absolutely no reason why this can't 
enhance anybody's teaching, you know, however long you've been teaching. Um, I've been math coordinator in my school for quite a while, but this, uh, this, uh, when I did it for my, myself without a reflective partner, it enhanced my teaching. Um, and when I worked with the reflective partner that you saw in the second example, it enhanced her teaching. And she is an experienced and very good teacher. She has uh, a master's degree in education and she was the math coordinator before me. Um, so, you know, I think, I think the knowledge core tech can improve anybody's teaching. Uh, and I'll close with these tips. Um, the knowledge core tech is designed to be used to reflect on maths. I think it has to be specific to maths. Um, don't try and work from memory video yourself even though it may feel uncomfortable for the first couple of minutes you do get used to it and it is well worth getting used to it select short critical incidents the more specific you are the better don't try and reflect on a whole lesson it's, it's too much choose your own focus if you're working with a reflective partner i think that's very valuable but don't let that person dictate to you it's about you and your own teaching uh, and discuss it with someone that you trust, a peer or a mentor, I think you will get a lot out of either. Um, and to end, uh, this is a quote, this is from Tim, uh, in observing and commenting on someone else's teaching, the supportive observer stands to learn as much or more as the one being observed. And I think I learned more when I was the reflective partner reflecting with somebody. Um, so if you ever have the opportunity to be the mentor, take it it costs you a little bit of time but it more than pays back um, if you have the opportunity to use a knowledge quartet on your own to reflect on your own teaching do it and all the better if you can team up with someone else in your school um, so um, here are it's not displaying uh, there's the references um, we'll see if anyone has some questions now um, but just um, a little cheeky favour. If you happen to be a primary school teacher in Wales and you can spare five or ten minutes, uh, my current research project, which is for my PhD, uh, I'm looking for participants. Um, that QR code will take you to a survey, um, which really, it really honestly is not very long. Um, people take so far between two and six minutes to complete it um, obviously though your priority now is uh, if you want to ask questions and I'm sure Margaret's already got some from the comments section I haven't got very many but I would like to just pick one up from actually from Zebedee again which says secondary two question mark I think implied um, uh, does anybody have any experience of um, uh, uh, of using this at secondary level as well in the same sort of way. I think Eleanor just had her hand right. up. Is that okay. right? right? Yes, Eleanor. I don't want to add, to address a question. I want to say something about the math anxiety because I truly don't understand it. Mm -hmm. Right, you can. I, 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 so why why don't so I'm coming from so you say this is a mostly a Western problem. I'm coming from Eastern part of Europe mm -hmm. and. I was truly lucky. My father told me when I was five years old, math is a game. And I'm trying and I'm doing that with my students. I'm teaching in a college. So unfortunately, I'm not teaching in the, in the primary in a way because I truly like to teach in my college and I truly like to teach my students. Uh, and for me, math is a game. And I'm trying to say to explain them and using gaming a lot in my teaching. I'm teaching from entry three to uh, level two and uh, voluntary GCC. So uh, all time I'm using gaming in maths and I explain to them maths is a game because it has rules. If you know the rule, you can play the game. If you don't know the rule, you can't play the game. And it's also practicing, practicing, practicing. So, and I'm not, I'm not a, like, uh, I'm not a kind and nice teacher. I'm like a soldier, if I can describe myself. I'm a former lawyer and reinvented in the math teacher. And I like, I truly like what I'm doing now because I use math to learn English. I, that so sounds really fascinating. Yes, I don't understand the anxiety in maths. And when, when they are coming to me, I'm I telling them. Start with the basic, put a, a strong base with the rules, yes. the basic rules of numbers, and then on that we can build. Other ways is impossible. 
Well, I really like what you say about treating it like a game. Yes. Um, you know, that idea that once you know the rules, you can play the game. I think that really takes the pressure off. I think exactly. Some, so, sometimes maths anxiety, I think, comes from um, thinking of uh, being very concerned about being right and being wrong and people don't children even yes. small children don't want to be wrong in front of their friends yes, um, and and I think sometimes as teachers we can we can shift that and I, it sounds to me like you're shifting that focus onto the yes. process exactly and, and the, the the learning and you know, as a teacher you can out you can outwardly value mistakes you know so a child a, a learner can give a wrong mistake and you can say oh that's fantastic and then you can unpick it get to the truth that's in the answer and then still um, reinforce what went wrong all, all time what I'm telling them right. guys do the mistakes in, in front of me I will be yeah. I, I, I'm fine with that don't yes. do them in the exam but yeah. why I wanted to say what I said is because you are teaching in primary you can change their perce per perception about maths because you are teaching you are with them for the basic and we'll be more relaxed if they are thinking that is a game. Yeah, hopefully, hopefully uh, the, the, you know, the younger you, you get the right attitudes across the better, but exactly. there are other, there are other, con other influences. Um, Thank you. you know, parent, and parent influences I truly like the that idea and I recorded myself yeah. and I saw my mistakes and I. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. Can, well I, can I butt in and just uh, say we've got one from uh, Sue Johnson Milder. Sue, would you like to um, unmute yourself and. Uh, Shall and, I stop and sharing? Yeah. Mm -hmm. I see everybody. Yeah. I don't know the lady who, I don't even know if it was Elena who was talking yeah, about yeah. understanding yeah. maths anxiety. Yeah, I'd was. love to have a longer conversation with you, Elena. Mm -hmm. um, we're talking about adverse prior experiences and we're talking about trauma in some cases. And I think you were very fortunate to have a connection with the person who taught you that maths is a game. And you need to understand, and I think we all need to understand, that it's very easy to develop anxiety when you're put under the kind of pressure that, that puts you on the spot. Your brain, anxiety is a natural defence. And, and I've got cooking anxiety, but I don't have maths anxiety. And that makes the, the adult women that I work with quite amused because they don't have cooking anxiety they have mass anxiety but I think it's important for us to understand anxiety and I know there are some colleagues who don't and I'm just working with a PhD student at Warwick at the moment who's gone into what I call his red zone for the first time in his life and has come to understand that you stop being able to do things you could do when you get into that anxious panic phobia state and we really have to learn to understand it um, and if you look at, um, I can send you a recent paper that I've written with, with Talma, which adopts the Scottish model of trauma-informed practice and says we all have to understand it and then some of us need to know what to do about it so that we can refer young people to somebody who can create enough safe space, enough trust mm -hmm. and enough relatedness for somebody to overcome those adverse prior experiences. I really hope that that hasn't offended you and that we can get you get you on board with this journey. <laughs> Thanks, Sue. Um, anybody... I'm here for learning. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. I think we I all are, yes. <laughs> I wonder if... Um... I wonder if we didn't really answer Zebedee's question then about yeah. secondary two. Yes, um, good say, I, good. I wonder maybe Tim has a has a comment for that. Yes, well, well, thank you. I was um, uh, the answer at Zebedee's. Yes, um, it has been um, applied in in um, first by um, uh, my uh, a colleague Libby Jarrett in Cambridge, and um, uh, it it was um, her study with um with secondary maths teachers that caused um her to propose um one um new code but um interestingly um i think that was 2011 um and not long after that um i began correspondence with um university maths teachers in dublin and um and they applied it to their own teaching in, in that case, it was um, with um, a, an observer, if you like, in the lecture who sat down and, and, and discussed um, following the lecture. But um, it's been very um, 
well, fascinating for me to see um, how the Norwich Quartet has um, been uh, tested and then applied where appropriately modified in co context beyond the initial um, primary maths one in which it was developed. Thanks, Tim. Thank you. Um, I think we should draw to an end now, really, because we're we're coming you know, on six o'clock. Um, but I would like to just quickly say that um, uh, you know the, the the notion of of anxiety. When I first the first excerpt that you showed us with the man and the fractions, um, Faye, uh, and uh, that second one, I immediately went into panic mode to say, yes, I think these quarters are equal, but I'm not absolutely sure. You know, and <laughs> what would I do? And of course, you know, what I would probably do is to say, well, let's explore this, shall we? <laughs> not being quite sure of the answer. Yes. But I think even after many years of experience, you can still get into panic mode when you realise you're not quite sure what the right answer is, even if something as simple as that. So it's, uh, I think, really important to uh, focus on this. But thank you so much for all your, uh, your, your account of your work, which I think has inspired a lot of us. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, for showing us a way forward that um, we could, uh, you know, could, could easily be implemented, at, at, as, you, as you point out, no enormous cost, um, but uh, would actually help people to to improve their maths teaching. That's um, that's been really really helpful. And thank you to everybody who's attended, and just to uh, repeat the fact that these the uh, recording and the uh, slides will all be up on the Maths Anxiety Trust website within a week or so. Uh, certainly, I'm not promising it in the next day or two, but and uh, I, I think they may. Soon. Sorry, to I think there may have been a couple of questions we didn't have time for. So just to say, right. anyone who wants to email me, uh, I'd be very happy to discuss right. things by email. Yeah, yeah. Sorry, there were there the were. Uh, I've just got those time is end, against so. us. Yeah, 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 yeah. But thank you very much, Faye, and thank you, Caroline, too, for My organizing pleasure. the technicalities of of this and organizing the, uh, uh, the the webinar. So thank you very much, and look forward to seeing you all at some future occasion. Thanks. <laughs>